Welcome to um, Melbourne, to La Trobe University. We're delighted to have uh, Professor Eric Lieper from Indiana University. Uh, let me also welcome my colleagues and, and some students. Uh, we're here today to talk about the monetary fiscal interactions. And, and, and the, the obvious question is, what, what interactions are we talking about? I mean, given that uh, most countries have an independent central bank, is there any interaction at all between uh, monetary and fiscal policy? Can you just outline briefly what the interaction is about? Well, there are always interactions between monetary and fiscal policy. Um, essentially, monetary and fiscal authorities have two tasks to accomplish. One is they have to target inflation, and the second is they have to stabilize debt. And there are different ways in which these two tasks can be accomplished. So you alluded to um, central banks targeting inflation, and that's one way that, that those tasks can be accomplished. But then the fiscal authority has to be um, assured that eventually, anytime there's an increase in debt today, taxes or spending will adjust in the future. But that's only one way that, that, that uh, those two tasks can be accomplished. What's, what's uh, the other way? The second way, which I, so I refer to the first one as the standard, I call it regime M. Uh, the second way is M regime for F, M for monetary, right. The second one is regime F for fiscal. And in this environment, you have that the fiscal authority actually controls inflation and the monetary authority ensures that government debt is stable. And so these two ways of interacting will accomplish those two tasks that at a basic level, monetary and fiscal policy have to accomplish. Now, I, th I think this, this second <coughs> channel is a bit, of a, uh, it's a bit controversial among, amongst economists, and I'm sure we, we're going to get to the details of, of it a bit later, but I've got a, a slide uh, that um, portrays the former uh, prime minister in Australia, um, John Howard, and I think this is a situation you, you, uh, most of you are familiar with. This is from the 2004 uh, election, federal election campaign where uh, uh, one of the parties, the, the Liberal Party, came, came along and said, look, um, you see, under uh, Labor, interest rates have always been uh, higher. This is the red uh, region. And you see, under the Liberal Party, uh, interest rates have always been lower. Um, um, and this claim uh, very much goes to the heart of uh, monetary fiscal interactions, right? Um, uh, because the claim is that uh, the, 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 the fiscal authority will actually have an effect on interest rates and, and, and inflation. So what would be the, the most natural channel? If, if the government's running a deficit, how does it affect, how does it affect um, uh, interest rates and inflation? What's the, most, you know, the, the first year macro type of story? Well, the first year macro story, which is, um actually hard to detect in data, is that uh, government borrows from the private sector and that increases the demand for loans and that would tend to drive up interest rates. Uh, and but that's a story that says that the central bank is focused singularly on, on keeping inflation under control. So that would be the standard story. Um, that would be the regime M that I was referring to. But there is this other regime also, Regime F, where uh, these fiscal deficits um, increase the wealth of the private sector. And when the private sector is wealthier, it goes out and tries to buy more goods and services. And by doing that, it drives up the inflation rate. And, and the private sector feels wealthier because there's no offsetting in the expectations that taxes will raise in the future to cover cover the the debt that's being accumulated. Yeah, so precisely. Yeah. So, for example, if you get a tax cut today, in this regime F world, uh, there's no expectation that taxes will go up in the future or that spending will be lower in the future, and so you feel better off and you try to convert that into consumption goods. Hmm. Uh, interesting. So it increases aggregate um, demand. Now, I, I would like to, I mean, uh, we really need to give a bit of a background about fiscal policy because that's what seems to be driving, <coughs> that's, that's, that's an interesting kind of development in, in the monetary fiscal interactions. And most of the, most of the current uh, media attention is on the short-term issues. Um, um, now, uh, so to kick off the discussion, uh, let's, let's look at this uh, slide, and this is from one of your papers using Congressional uh, Budget Office. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit of the background of what, what we see here? Um, well, what the Congressional Budget Office does in the United States is it does these long-term projections. 
And what's labeled the baseline scenario there assumes that current policies will remain in place forever. By current policies, I mean current tax and spending policies. And then to produce this picture, it says, okay, given all the spending obligations of the government, if we just roll those over into debt, so we um, finance them by borrowing, then you get these two lower uh, pictures. So let me maybe it, you can't see it clearly. This is uh, the lines show you the uh, the public debt as a percentage of GDP, and what you see, uh, and for the United States, and what you see traditionally, that was uh, uh, around the 50 percent or below uh, the the 50 percent uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio, with the exception of the Second World War. But what you see is that even the baseline, a relatively optimistic scenario, uh, uh, would would lead to some um, serious debt problems in the future. What about the alternative scenario? Uh, okay, so the alternative scenario is uh, one in which the CBO builds in the adjustments in policies that they think are most likely to occur. Um, so under those assumptions, you can see that uh, debt just explodes. Uh, so the interesting thing about this picture is the baseline scenario is one in which um, nobody believes uh, one that nobody believes can happen, or would happen, I mean, because policies would change. But the alternative scenario with the exploding debt is one that, from an economic standpoint, can't happen. Um, it's impossible for debt to grow as depicted in those blue lines. When, I mean, at what uh, um, percentage uh, of, of debt to GDP ratio uh, do countries start to uh, run into debt problems? Uh, Varies a lot from country to country. Uh, in the 1990s, Sweden ran into problems at levels of 70% debt GDP. Uh, Belgium, on the other hand, was running over 100% debt GDP and didn't seem to run into any problems at all. Japan now is approaching 200% uh, debt GDP, and while they've been downgraded, there's no obvious um, premium on, on the interest rates that they have to pay. So it, it very much is a country-specific issue. Now, um, in relation to this picture, the, the, most of the media attention <coughs> is on the debt ceiling in the United States. Uh, now, um, we'll, uh, we'll talk a lot about uh, the fact that the, the biggest problem is actually looming on the horizon, but can you give us a, a brief summary of what's, what's happening now and how you think the situation is going to be resolved uh, or whether, uh, what, what kind of, if, if it's not being resolved, uh, what your research predicts w could actually start happening at the end of July when financial markets realize that, in fact, maybe there will not be a, an agreement uh, reached? Well, I think the answer to the question of uh, what's going on now is really a political answer. Um, I think the short-run fiscal problems, and especially in the U.S., this debt ceiling issue, is just a red herring. Um, because politicians don't want to talk about the big problem which is what we see in the out years. And, but they want to look like they're doing something. And so um, you have the political parties positioning and saying, um, you know, we want this kind of adjustment versus that kind of adjustment. And it makes the, the, the voters, look, it appears to the voters as if they're actually doing something. Um, what, but I think it's, it's really non, a non-issue. Um, what economic theory would suggest is as we get closer and closer to that, that D-Day, um, which... August 2nd, uh, I think. It. Yeah, I've heard different estimates. July 22nd was another D-Day, so who knows. Um, I think financial markets will start to get increasingly nervous because it's unclear that the U.S. will be able to honor its, its debt obligations. And um, this would be absolutely unprecedented. Um, and you might start to see interest rates in the U.S. and therefore in the rest of the world start to run up. So mm -hmm. that's what theory would and, say. And what would, would rating <coughs> companies, I mean, would they wait for something to happen or already in late July they might uh, do something which will further uh, kind of trigger, trigger the problem or further uh, make it worse? Uh? Well, they're making a lot of noise already, right? Uh, I think the U.S. is on negative watch or something now. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if it got downgraded. 
Uh, that's a funny game that gets played, though, so I don't know that I read too much into what the bond reading agencies say. Hmm. Now, um, continuing on to the next slide, uh, let's talk about some long-run driving uh, um, forces behind uh, what we've just seen behind the, the debt problems. Uh, what you see here is the old age dependency ratio, which is defined <coughs> as um, uh, the proportion of population 65, aged 65 plus, um, over the, the population between 14 and, and 64. And what we, this is G7, and we also plotted uh, uh, China and Australia for comparison. And what you see is, is that countries are uh, growing older. Um, now, wh wh why, why is it? Why is it that they're growing older? <laughs> so what are the main driving forces? Well, after here? World War II, there was a baby boom in, in most of these countries. And uh, so fertility rates were extremely high relative to uh, what they've been since then. And now these, uh, these, this baby boom is starting to retire. And the, the fiscal problem here is that most of these pension plans are um, not funded. So they are sort of pay as you go. And that means that they rely on there being a lot of workers for every retiree. But as the as the populations age, you get fewer and fewer workers per retiree, and therefore um, the revenues that you were getting from those workers are shrinking, mm -hmm. and um, and that's why we have these big problems. But it's also healthcare, right? I mean, health health costs <coughs> increase uh, almost exponentially once yes. uh, once the age of about 65 is reached. So that's that's another. And health insurance. I mean, health. Health costs have been growing much ra more rapidly mm. than overall inflation mm. in most countries. Um, th and, and then on top of that, the, the vast majority of expenditures occur in the last year of life. And so as we get more and more people who are reaching their last years of life, um, those health mm. expenditures rise dramatically. Let's move on to the next slide to see uh, a slightly different perspective. This is the total dependency ratio. It's, so it's the the kids plus the old over um, over the the bulk of the um, population between 14 and 64. And what you see is that <coughs> it's we've really in the early 2000s we've really been in the situation where. Uh, um, in fact, somehow more, most favorable. Um, and uh, uh, the chairman, uh, Ben Munanke, talked about the global saving glut. And we do, we do see that, you know, if you have uh, a lot of people working and not that many old, not that many young, then it creates maybe excess of savings. And, and the interesting implication is that as, as we move into the future, uh, that situation is, is going to be quite dramatically um, reversed. Um, so we might uh, discuss some of the implications for the capital and labor markets a little bit later. Now, can we have the next slide? Um, it actually shows that, uh, that the situation is even worse than, uh, than what the pictures uh, show. So this is uh, uh, pensioner per worker ratio. And the, so this is the dark shaded area. And the, the light shaded area is what we uh, just saw previously. It's, it's the old age dependency ratio. And you see, for most countries, the pensioner per worker ratio is is 50 to 100 percent higher uh, than than the old age dependency ratio. Why? Because many people below 65 are, are obviously uh, not working, and and uh, and there's a there's a few other reasons. So so the situation seems quite. Now the next slide um, um, is 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 going to show us break it down for advanced countries as well as developing countries. So so if the whole world is aging, or can we think through the the implications for capital markets? I mean if if, if, if all the retirees are now looking to use all their savings, but there's actually no one on the other side who would provide, who would, who would be willing to save and, and provide that, uh, what, what's the implication for capital markets? Uh, I mean, well, are we gonna interest rates will rise. <laughs> I mean, well, it's, yeah. it's fairly straightforward. I mean, and, and I think the, the U.S. is a bit of a microcosm here because we've been relying very heavily on um, the savings rates in China, Japan, uh, the Middle East, uh, in order to finance our uh, lavish mm. uh, government policies. And uh, we won't be able to rely on that. Mm. 